converted man here. What's up guys? Today I wanted to take a close look at an issue that stumps a lot of Christians. Oftentimes Christians get super enthusiastic about apologetics and they memorize all these arguments for the resurrection or the Bible or, you know, um, their own personal experience through miracles um, or min any number of arguments that they'll use to argue for Christianity. But then the atheist will make an argument from naturalism saying that miracles have been proven not to happen or that we have no evidence that miracles can happen and therefore we should assume naturalism. Yes, naturalism, that is, the things that we observe to be in the real world, is a safe assumption to start with. If there's something more going on, then we would be able to observe it in the real world. Otherwise, it's not something that happens in the real world. If we can't test it, if we can't measure it, if we can't verify it, then it might not be a thing at all. The idea that the universe only operates under a system of natural laws, of natural causes and effects, and therefore that um, if you're going to make any supernatural claims, you have to either prove it scientifically or it's already been disproven. And this seems to stump a lot of Christians. They don't know how to respond to this. Uh, I come across these attacks all the time. The other day, I posted a video giving evidence uh, that the Gospels came from eyewitnesses. By evidence, I'm pretty sure you mean bad argument, but even if you had absolute concrete proof that the person that wrote the thing is an eyewitness, that's completely and wholly irrelevant. People are mistaken about things all the time. People think that they've seen things that aren't actually there. There's been thousands of Elvis sightings. There's been thousands of alien abductees, but we know that Elvis is dead, and we know for pretty good certainty that aliens from some other planet have not visited us. But if you listen to those that saw Elvis and really believe that that's true, or if you listen to the people that think that they've been kidnapped by an uh, extraterrestrial, they're going to tell you, no, it's true, I saw it. And they'd be willing to write down that they saw it because they're very passionate about it. Books are written about Bigfoot. People have seen Bigfoot here, there, everywhere. And Nessie. Yes, Nessie. Even though there is no monster there, people will claim that they saw it and they will write books about it. They remain claims until verified. If the claim is not extraordinary, then we could tentatively grant it. But the more extraordinary the claim is, the more evidence we're going to want for that claim. For example, Bigfoot. There hasn't been a creature like that ever to have been found dead. No bones of this creature. The eating habitat of this creature seems to be widely diverse around the globe which doesn't fit with what we know about animals it doesn't seem to leave behind any clear markings or any poop so there is zero evidence that it leaves behind and nobody seems to be able to capture it so until somebody does all you have are claims about it and then there's no reason to believe those claims because you have no additional evidence that that thing is a thing in the first place. And then if the description of the thing becomes ludicrous or extraordinary, then you should doubt that it's even a thing. Well, I saw a unicorn. Really? You saw a horse with a single horn on its head. Maybe I could grant that. Well, and it was flying in the sky. Okay, did it have wings? No, it just flew in the sky. <laughs> okay, and where did you see that? Right over that hill. You have to go over that hill to see it. Um, how about, no, you, you, you get it here. You capture it, you get a picture, you do something that shows that it's even a thing. I'm not going to waste my time. 
Oh, no, it's only in that one area. You go over the hill, it's like, well, it's not there. Well, you scared it away, right? You can always do that with these sort of claims. You can always move the goalposts. So if you don't have anything more than some written account, you don't really have anything at all. And then one lady commented, she said, you mean the entire Gospels? Like the walking on the water? Because we know that that doesn't happen. And implicit in statements like these are uh, naturalistic assumptions. They, she assumes that miracles can't happen, and therefore uh, she says that the Gospels can't be reliable. It's not even a matter of assuming that these things can't happen. It's that there's zero demonstration that such a thing would even be possible. Now, if you're sticking with the physical realm of things, humans can put things on their feet that would give them enough buoyancy to walk on water. But you're talking large shoes at this point. You're not talking bare feet or regular shoes. I'm not sure what Jesus was supposed to have had on his feet. Maybe he had ginormous shoes on and was able to walk on water that way. Or maybe he walked in water that was shallow enough that he could walk and seem to walk on even though he's not really walking on it or maybe there's some uh rocks underneath him and only he knew about them and he was si he was simply standing on top of the rocks and people thought that he was walking on water and he was just kind of moving about on those rocks somewhere out at sea so it seemed to be rather impressive who knows but what we do know is Physics doesn't allow for humans to walk upon water with bare feet. Until you demonstrate that this is even possible, then there's no reason for us to think that it's possible. But the problem is, we're staying constrained by physics. And you're saying, oh, this breaks physics. It breaks the laws of nature. It has no explanation to it. If you had Jesus and you could put him in a lab and you could put water in there and you could have him walk back and forth on the water, you wouldn't be able to tell how it was that he was doing it. Your instruments would simply fail you. You would have zero explanation to what was the mechanism going on during his walking back and forth on the water. Because if you had an explanation, then it would be a mundane phenomenon and not a supernatural phenomenon. A supernatural phenomenon apparently has no ordinary explanations ever. Basically, it's magic. And so today I'm going to show you four very pragmatic ways you can defend miracle claims against skeptics' arguments. The way that you defend your miracle claims against skeptics' arguments is you first have to categorize the uh, naturalistic claim into one of four categories. And I'm going to stop you right there because all you're going to do is tell us some bad arguments and give those people that happen to watch this video some bad ideas to use rather than, I don't know, actual evidence. Just do the miracle. Now. Some Christians believe that the gifts of the Spirit are still active and others think that they were only active for a limited amount of time. And there's disagreement on what the different gifts even are or what they do. But if you had some of those, well then that would be something that we could verify in some way, shape, or form. But of course that would mean testing. And then it would also mean that there would be some failure condition to the test. Take talking in tongues, for example. Some people believe it's just saying gibberish, but that this gibberish can be interpreted by somebody else, and then that somebody else knows what it means and prays for the church. Well, there would be a way to test that. You would say, okay, the person said whatever this is, the other person interprets that. Then we get another interpreter, and another interpreter, and they all agree without and they don't get to consult each other and if they all agree well then maybe we have an actual language but then anybody could figure out that language because if it's a real language then we can translate it but if it's a magical language that only a certain individual at a certain time can sometimes translate when there's no way to test it well then it's a non thing it's a non entity at all whatsoever some people think that spiritual discernment is a thing. This is something I believed in when I was a Christian. I thought I had it in spades. 
And it's this ability to sense uh, if good or evil spirits are around. In fact, I knew a Christian that sort of made a claim once on Twitter that's like, I don't want to have atheists around me because like, I can sense the, the, their evilness or whatever. And I'm like, really? We can test that. I'll give you a thousand dollars if you can prove that this is a real thing. Oh, it's just because you can't test it doesn't mean it's not real. No, it does actually mean it's not real if we can't test it. This would have been a very simple thing to verify as being a true thing, but she wouldn't do it because she couldn't do it because it's not an actual thing. If it was, we could devise a test that would show that it was. But you don't have miracles on demand, apparently. No matter what happens, you happen to believe about the spiritual gifts, none of them are testable. Because reasons. Okay, and you can't summon a miracle on command. Because reasons. Alright, so what are we left with? We're left with an empty assertion that you have no evidence for. Most common ways that I've heard naturalists make their claims. So when you start prying a little bit and asking the naturalists some questions, you can often quickly find out which one of these four naturalistic methods they're using to drive their naturalistic claims. Number one, you must assume a natural explanation until you first prove that the supernatural exists. No, you don't have to assume anything starting out. You don't have to have any assumptions about any ways that the world works at all. You can simply start by observation and testing. So what am I observing if I'm looking at something that somebody claims to be a miracle? What is it that I'm looking for? How do I identify a miracle? How does anybody identify a miracle? What methodology are we going to use to record and document said miracle? Number two, you must demonstrate that the supernatural exists scientifically or with the scientific method, with controlled tests. Whenever they're using this uh, assumption, they often use a bunch of scientific jargon, like show me some controlled tests, just some scientific studies or you know, something from a lab that proves that the supernatural exists. Yeah, that would be evidence. That's what they're asking for. That's what they've been asking for for years, that's what every atheist that I've interacted with, appealed to the minority of those that I've interacted with, but nonetheless, they all want this type of evidence. If we had it, great. But then that would kind of make it not a miracle anymore because if it's mundane, if it's explainable by science, then it's not a miracle anymore. So you could never use science to verify it because it's magic. So how could you verify it? Well, you couldn't, ever, with anything. There would be zero way to verify it because you wouldn't have any system that would be able to do it. If you devise the system that could do it, then that makes the supernatural mundane. The moment that you can explain how the miracle works is the moment that it stops being a miracle. It's only magical when it's unexplainable. So there is zero way to prove it because if there was, then it wouldn't be magic. I mean, miracle. Same thing. Number three, you'll often hear a more philosophical argument coming from Hume, which is that the probability of a miracle occurring is so small that it can never be determined to have occurred historically. And this often uses inductive reasoning. They say that we see uh, so many natural events happening and we never see supernatural events happening. Therefore, it's so improbable that a supernatural thing could happen that you must assume a naturalistic thing has happened. I would say the probability is zero until we have a demonstration that a miracle is even a thing that is a thing in the first place which, depending on the definition of miracle, is probably impossible. So it's going to remain zero probability because of its definition. Of course, the definition might be wrong, but then you have to come up with a different definition, and more importantly than defining it, you need to demonstrate it, which is something you haven't done and will not do. 
And then the fourth assumption they say is that historians are not able to make judgment calls on whether a supernatural event has occurred. Historians only deal with facts and the historical critical method uh, posits natural explanations. Um, so that way you can have historians from all different religions coming to the same conclusions based on the evidence because historians are not in the practice of identifying supernatural events Historians all have a common goal regardless of their own religious beliefs and their common goal is to provide a natural explanation of cause and effect for the historical evidence that we have. I'm not sure where you're getting any of that from, but I'm going to grant that it might be true. It would have been nice to have some sort of citation. You got a ton of blank screen there that you could have used. Oh well. At any rate, so the problem is that if we granted supernatural occurrences, we'd have to grant all of them. Unless we had some way to say which ones did happen and which one didn't happen. And how in the bleep would we do that? Alright, so now let's look at each one of these naturalistic arguments one by one and see how you should approach responding to this. Oftentimes it's very difficult to answer a naturalist's objections if you're focusing on their one specific objection. Like if she says, we know people don't walk on water. Then it's very hard for me to say, yes they do, I have proof that people walk on water. Or if people say, okay, if supernatural things occur, show me some uh, people without arms and legs, grow out their arms and legs. Sometimes it's difficult to respond to their very narrow arguments, but what we can do is we categorize what category their argument is under, and then we use our prepared response for that specific category. Hey, an honest apologist. Here's how to do this. Just use this prepared thing. Don't think for yourself. Don't use critical analysis. Don't be skeptical. Don't doubt. Just use this canned copy pasta response that I've made for you. That's all. <laughs> yeah. Don't think for yourself. Don't come up with an answer. Don't try to think about it. No, no. Here, here. Here's an answer. Here. Fill in the blank in the pamphlet with this. There you go. Here's the answer, you idiot. Moron. Use this, stupid. Jeez, my word. I would say no. 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 Learn how to argue, first of all. But you're going to need to learn how to use logic to do that. That would be something that I would say. But then, of course, if they do learn logic, they might not believe in miracles anymore. Maybe. I don't know. So the way that you do it is you listen to their specific argument, you take a step back, and you attack that entire category of naturalistic viewpoint. Because you don't have evidence and you don't have your own argument all you can do is go on the offensive and attack their ideas that you think that they might have because you've filtered them into these categories great yeah wonderful terrific uh no how about let's start with honesty first of all hey the New Testament talked about Jesus walking on water. I've never seen anyone walk on water. So I don't believe that that's possible. I mean, do you have any evidence that people walk on water? Response, no, I do not have any evidence that people walk on water. I've never seen it either. You're correct. We don't have evidence for that sort of thing. There you go. And you say, okay, well, why do you believe, you know, then we have an actual discussion rather than canned responses. You know, but that would take critical thought and thinking and stuff. And we're not going to do that. Some naturalists argue that you must assume a natural explanation for your evidence until the supernatural is proven to exist. I hear this argument all the time. I say, you know, Jesus rose from the dead and then skeptics say, well... Uh, first you have to show me that the supernatural even exists. If you're going to say that something new supernatural happened, just show me that the supernatural exists, or else we should assume that a natural explanation has happened. The problem with this view is that it places a burden of proof on the theist that is stronger than the burden of proof on the naturalist. 
<laughs> no, that no. <laughs> you have the full burden of proof completely. Period. End of story. Not that you have more. You have the burden of proof in full because you made the claim. The skeptic isn't making a claim. See, you're saying that they're saying something that they don't really say. They say, we're going to assume naturalism. Aha, there's a claim. No, you don't. Again, you don't have to assume naturalism at all. You don't have to assume anything. You just have to be able to somehow demonstrate that the thing that you're talking about is actually a thing. That doesn't require naturalism. It just requires demonstration. Well, but I can't demonstrate it. It happened in the past. Okay, how do you know that it happened in the past then? Well, I've got eyewitnesses. Okay, are we going to grant eyewitnesses for other events that are similar to that or not? What is our methodology? Do we even have a methodology? How does it apply? Does it apply universally the same way in every instance across every historical text? If I write down something today that makes it claim about something supernatural, how would you go about showing that this is true or false? What methodology would you utilize to do so? The skeptic's role is simply to withhold judgment one way or the other until you have explained your methodology, you have demonstrated your idea to be true, you've given them something more than a bad argument. So the naturalist says that you have to assume everything has a natural explanation until I first prove that the supernatural realm exists. But the problem with this is that they are assuming the naturalistic realm exists. It's actually impossible to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that even the natural realm exists. And this is where I retort with lobsters exist. If we cannot agree that lobsters exist, we done. That's it. I'm done. I'm walking away. Either lobsters exist or nonsense reigns supreme. Lobsters do exist. Therefore, nonsense doesn't reign supreme, and that argument it has all sorts of flaws in it, and I encourage you to point them out in the comments section. At any rate, <laughs> reality is real. We assert that. Whether we're certain about it or not, I really don't care. Whether we can say it with 100% truth, doesn't matter. It's there. It's real. We verify it. Okay, we can talk about it, we can test it, we can demonstrate it, it's there. And if you're going to retreat into hard sophomores and be like, well, but you can't prove anything, uh, come on. Is that really all you've got is, well, but you can't prove it either, so it's a too que, too que, que. It's you as well, but you can't really prove your point. Well, no, reality is real, and there's actual evidence of it all around you. Well, I'm going to borrow some uh, apologetics right now. Look around you. See all that stuff? That's real. Ugh. Now, that might sound a little bit crazy at first. What do you mean you can't prove that the natural realm exists? Well, this has been demonstrated through something called solipsism or epistemological solipsism. Yeah, that's what I said. So it's not proven. It's just kind of a thought experiment. Ah, screw it. We have the external universe and we have our mind. We experience the external universe through our mind. But the only way that we can experience uh, the external universe is through our senses. Our five senses give us information about the external universe. If you can't see it, then you don't know what it looks like. If you can't hear it, you don't know what it sounds like. We need all of our senses to tell us about the external universe. But we have to assume that what our senses tell us is accurate. You can't prove that what your senses tell us is accurate. Um, because any test you use starts with the assumption that your senses are accurate. I think this is why we developed the scientific method to try to get away from this problem in full. And by the way, you don't need all senses to know about the external world. Uh, but the more you have, the better, and there's more than just five. But whatever. You know, facts. <laughs> Nuance. <laughs> we don't need that. Citations. Nah, we don't need any of that. Nah. All right, again, I'm just going to assert that reality is real and move on. This is a non-point. If we can't prove that anything is true, then we're done. That's it. Your side isn't true. My side isn't true. 
And then guess what? You don't get to be a theist, you get to be a skeptic. So, thanks for playing, I guess I win. But you're not going to become a skeptic, are you? So I guess I don't win. Darn it. Well, this guy has more to say, but I've run out of patience. So I'll continue this in part two. Maybe, if I feel like it. I don't know. We'll see. Don't forget, lobsters exist. Unless they don't. I don't know. Can't prove that they don't. Can't prove lobsters aren't magical. You know? Can't prove that. Yeah.